All right, welcome back everybody. Day five. Now, <laughs> I want to start this with a shout out to my number one fan, Bryce. Thanks, buddy. I don't know if you've noticed, but this these videos have just gone viral. There, I'm up to, let's see, what is it? Let me see if I can carry the one, four, function f of x divided by six subscribers. <laughs> and only three of those are in my family. And let's see, how many comments did I get total? If I, if I count Bryce's and everybody else's, one. Yes, yeah, so it's just been a sensation. Just swept the country faster than uh, what's currently sweeping the country. These viral videos on Hey Nostradamus. Apparently everybody wants to hear these uh, Hey Nostradamus videos. And let's see, the, dur the average duration of watch time of these 20 minute videos has been 15 seconds. So people are loving it. They're logging in and just staying for the whole 15 seconds and then logging back out, fully informed about what's going on in this book. So. Uh, I just want to thank you all for that. It's been a, it's been an amazing run. I hope I can uh, continue this meteoric rise to the top of the YouTubers. I mean, um, actually, I don't know who any like famous YouTubers are right now. I should go ask my daughter. I mean, I know the Dolan twins, but I don't know if they're any, if they're big anymore. Oh, Rebecca Zamar Zamorlo Zamalo Zamo Zamolo Zamorlo. I don't know. My kids watch that. Oh, Chad Wild Clay. My kids watch that one too. Spy Ninjas. <laughs> okay. Enough of that. All right, we're going to start part two. If you have your book, it's page 43. Hey, buddy. <laughs> it's page 43 in your book. Uh, if you're the PDF, it's part two. It's Jason. Um, and we're going to start there. I was just thinking on my uh, my six subscribers. So. <laughs> my, my one comment. And the average. My, my, me, Jason, should have more subscribers. Oh, yeah, I think four of the subscribers are in my family. I forgot about the kiddos. Okay, so that means I got two. Too? I'm right to the top of the YouTubers. I'm about as big as Rebecca Zamorla. What's, no. your, what's her name? Rebecca Zamorla. She has like 4 million. 4 million subscribers? I'm, I'm just a little bit behind her? No, I think she has like 10 million. Does she have more than Chad Walkley? Yes. Okay. She has like 10 million I'm just this. I'm just this much behind them. All right. So we're going to start with chapter two, uh, Jason's section. Now, notice that it's Jason. It's 11 years later. It's 1999. And I'm not going to suggest that he didn't love Cheryl because I know that he did. But imagine yourself 11 years from now looking back on a relationship you were in in high school. You know, you're going to have a different perspective on it. Um, even if right now, I, I bet I bet there are times that you were in a relationship when you were younger than you are as a senior. You were younger and you thought, oh, I love him or her so much. This is, he's my everything. She's my number one. She's going to be my lifelong. I'm gonna, she's the one. I'm, I'm, I'm marrying her. You know, and then three months later, you've broken up and you can't stand to talk to her, can't look at her, right? Because when you're in the moment, stuff feels a lot different than when you uh, look back on a relationship, right? So this is 11 years later and it's Jason, okay? Hey, buddy. You won't see me in any of the photographs after the massacre. You know the ones I mean. The wire service shots of the funerals, students felt pinning teenage poetry on Cheryl's casket, Teenage prayer groups and sweats and scrumps and sweats and scrunches huddle on the school's slippery gym floor. Hi. 6.30 a.m. prayer breakfast in the highway off-ramp chain restaurants with all the men wearing ties while dreaming of hash browns. I'm in none of them. And if you had seen me, I sure wouldn't have been praying. I want to say that right from the start. Just one hour ago, I was a good little citizen in a Toronto Dominion bank branch over North Van, standing in line, and none of this is even on my mind. I was there to deposit a check from my pot-bellied contractor, Boss Les, and I was wondering if I should blow off the afternoon's work. My hand reached down into my pocket, and instead of a check, my sunburnt fingers removed the invitation to my brother's memorial service. I felt as if I had just opened all the windows of a hot, muggy car. So what did we just learn there? What did we learn there? Did we learn that Jason's brother Kent died? Yeah, we learned that Jason's brother Kent, remember, he was the head of the Western Division of the Youth Alive. He's obviously dead because there is an invitation to his memorial service. It's actually been a year since he died. And this is like the year anniversary memorial service. Right? Oh, well, next time. I folded it away and wrote down today's date on the deposit slip. I checked the wall calendar. August 19th, 1999. And what the heck? I wrote a whole row of zeros before the year so that the date read August 19th. Zero 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 one nine nine nine. Even if you hated math, which I certainly do, 
you'd know that this is, some, is still mathematically the same thing as 1999. When I gave the slip and the check to the teller, Dean, his eyes widened, and he looked up at me as if I'd handed him a hold-up note. Sir, he said, this isn't a proper date. I said, yes, it is. What makes you think it isn't? The extra zeros. Dean was wearing a deep blue shirt, which annoyed me. What is your point? I asked. Sir, the year is 1999, not 0000000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000 1999. It's the same thing. No, it's not. I'd like to speak with the branch manager. Dean called over Casey, a woman who was maybe about my age and who had the pursed hardness of someone who spends her days delivering bad news to people and knows she'll be doing it until her hips shatter. Casey and Dean had a hushed talk and then she spoke to me. Mr. Clausen, may I ask you why you've written this on your slip? I stood my ground. Putting more zeros in front of 1999 doesn't make the year any different. Technically, no. Look, I hated math as much as you probably did. I didn't hate math, Mr. Clausen. Casey was on the spot, but then so was I. It's not as if I'd walked into the bank planning all those extra zeros. They just happened, and now I had to defend them. Maybe what the zeros do point out is that in a billion years, and there will be a billion years, we'll all be dust. Not even dust. We'll all be molecules. Silence. I said, just think, there are still a few billion years of time out there just waiting to happen. Billions of years, and we're not going to be here to see them. Silence. Casey said, Mr. Clausen, if this is some sort of joke, I can try to understand its abstract humor, but I don't think this slip meets the requirements of a legal banking document. Silence. I said, but doesn't it make you think or want to think about what? About what happens to us after we die? This was my real mistake. Dean telegraphed Casey a savvy little glance, and in a flash I knew that they knew about me, about Cheryl, about 1988, and about my reputation as a borderline nutcase. He never really got over it, you know. I'm used to this. I was furious, but kept my cool. I said, I think I'd like to close my account, convert to cash as if I could. The request was treated with the casualness I might have received if I had asked them to change a 20. Of course, Dean could help you, Mr. Clausen, close out his, oh, sorry. Of course, Dean, could you help Mr. Clausen close out his account? I asked, that's it? Dean, could you help Mr. Clausen close out his account? No debate? No questions? Casey looked at me. Mr. Clausen, I have two daughters and I can barely think past next month's mortgage, let alone the year 2,001,999. My hunch is that you'd be happier elsewhere. I'm not trying to get rid of you, but I think you know where I'm coming from. She wasn't wearing a wedding band. Can I take you out to lunch? I asked. What? Dinner then? No. The snacking line was eavesdropping big time. Dean, there should be no complications in closing Mr. Clausen's account. She looked at me. Mr. Clausen, I have to go. My anger became gray emotional fuzz and I just wanted to leave. Inside of five minutes, Dean had severed my connection to his bank and I stood on the curb smoking a hand rolled cigarette. My shirt untucked and $5,210 stuffed into pockets of my green dungarees. I decided to leave the serene, heavily bylawed streets of North Vancouver and drive to West Vancouver down near the ocean. At the 17th and Bellevue CIBC, I opened a checking account. When I looked behind the tellers, I saw an open vault. I asked if it was possible to run a safety deposit box, which took all of three minutes to do. That box is where I'm going to place all of this once it's finished. And here's the deal. If I get walloped by a bus next year, this letter is going to be placed in storage until May 30th, 2019, when you, my two nephews, turn 21. If I hang around long enough, I might hand it to you in person. But for now, that's where this letter is headed. Well, we just figured out, um, we know now that uh, Jason's brother Kent has, is dead. There's a memorial service coming up. He's got an invitation in his pocket and that he's writing a letter. So his whole section, Cheryl's section was her talking from not alive and not dead, wherever she was in the in-between world. You can, you can go. Um, her, Cheryl's talking um, and telling us what happened. Now, this is Jason, 11 years later, writing a letter to his nephews. And if you put two and two together, that means they are the sons of his brother, Kent, and his Kent's wife, Barb. Okay? Just so you know, I've been writing all of this in the cab of my truck, parked on Bellevue, down by Ambleside Beach, near the pier with all its bratty kids on rollerblades, and the Vietnamese guys with their crab traps pursuing E. coli. I'm using a pen embossed with Travel Lodge, and I'm writing on the back of Les's pink invoice forms. The wind is heating up. God, it feels nice on my face. And I feel, in the most SUV commercial sense of the word, free. Ambleside Beach, the same place that Cheryl said she worked to get away from the Alivers and um, to get a break from them during the summers. How to start. 
First off, Cheryl and I were married. No one knows that but me and now you. It was insane, really. I was 17 and starved for sex, but I was still stuck in my family's religious work. So only husband-wife sex was allowed, and even then for procreation only, and even then only while both partners wore heavy wool tweeds so as to drain the act of pleasure. So when I suggested to Cheryl that we fly to Las Vegas and get hitched, she floored me when she said yes. It was an impulsive request I made after our math class on an educational 16mm film about gambling. The movie was supposed to make high school students more enthusiastic about statistics. I mean, what were these filmmakers thinking? And what was I thinking? Marriage? Las Vegas? We flew down there one weekend and, I mean, we weren't even people then. We were so young and out of it. We were like baby chicks. No, we were like zygotes, little zygotes calving from the airport to Caesar's Palace. And all I could think about was how hot and dry the air was. In any event, it seems like a billion years ago. This is a great first example of what I said at the beginning, the difference in perspective. For Cheryl, it had just happened a couple of weeks ago. So she was still caught up in the moment of how that much in love they were and they drove to Las Vegas and how romantic and movie-esque it was and how incredible. And Jason now, 11 years later, not that he didn't feel that same thing when they were getting married, but 11 years later looks back and says, we were babies. What were we thinking? We didn't know anything about life yet. We were zygotes. That's how young we were. Um, happens to all of us. You know, we get older and look back and, and perspectives on things change. It doesn't take away the importance of the event. It doesn't take away the meaning of the event or how special it was or how in love they were, because they were. Um, but he's looking back on it now from uh, someone who's 29, you know, not someone who's 18. It's 11 years later, remember? 18. Or they were, actually, they were 17, so that makes them 28 because they used fake IDs. So they were 17 and now 28 because they used fake IDs. All right. <sighs> Around sunset, we got married using our fake IDs. Our witness was a slob of a cabbie who drove us down the strip. For the next six weeks, my grades evaporated, sports became a nuisance, and my friends became ghosts. The only thing that counted was Cheryl, and because we kept the marriage secret, it was way better and more forbidden feeling than if we'd won, waited and done all the sensible stuff. There were some problems when we got home. This churchy group, Cheryl and I were in, Youth Alive, crabby morality spooks who spied on us for weeks, likely with the blessing of my older brother, Kent. When I was in 12th grade, Kent was in second year at the University of Alberta, but he was still a honcho, head honcho, he was still a honcho, and I can only imagine the phone conversations he must have been having with the local alive creeps. Were the lights on or off? Which lights? Do they order in pizza? What time do they leave? Separately or together? <laughs> As if we hadn't noticed we were being spied on. Yet in fairness, the alivers were baby chicks too. We all were. 17 is nothing. You're still in the womb. Yes, her name is Barb. There are a number of things a woman can tell about a man who is roughly 29 years old. Sitting in the cab of a pickup truck at 3.37 in the afternoon on a weekday, facing the Pacific, riding furiously on the back of pink invoice slips. Such a man may or may not be employed, but regardless, there's mystery there. If this man is with a dog, then that's good because it means he's capable of forming relationships. But if the dog is a male dog, that's probably a bad sign because it means the guy is likely a dog too. A girl dog is much better. But if the guy is over 30, any kind of dog is a bad sign regardless, because it means you stop trusting humans altogether. <coughs> In general, if nothing else, guys my age with dogs are going to be work. Then there's stubble. Stubble indicates a possible drinker, but if he's driving a van or a pickup truck, he hasn't hit bottom yet, so watch out, honey. A guy writing something on a clipboard while facing the ocean at 3.37 p.m. may be writing poetry, or he may be writing a letter begging someone for forgiveness. But if he's writing real words, not just a job estimate or something businessy, then more likely than not, this guy has something emotional going on, which, which could mean he has a soul. Maybe you're generous, and maybe you assume that everybody has a soul. I'm not so sure. I know that I have one, even though I'd like to reject my father's every tenant and say I don't. But I do. It feels like a small, glowing ember buried deep inside my guts. I also believe people can be born without souls. My father believes this too. Possibly the soul issue was we the soul issue we agree upon. I've never found a technical term for such a person. Monster doesn't quite nail it, but I believe it to be true. That aside, I think you can safely say that a guy in West Vancouver facing the ocean, writing stuff on a clipboard in the mid-afternoon has troubles. If I've learned anything in 29 years, is that every human being you see in the course of a day has a problem that's sucking up at least 70% of his or her radar. 
my gift, bad choice of words, is that I can look at you, him, her, them, whoever, and tell right away what's keeping them awake at night. Money, feelings of insignificance, overwhelming boredom, evil children, job troubles, or perhaps death in one of its many costumes perched in the wings. What surprises me about humanity is that, it, that in the end, such a narrow range of plights defines our moral lives. Whoop. Joyce, my faithful white lab, just bolted upright. What's up, girl, huh? Up is a border collie with an orange tennis ball in his mouth. Brody, Joyce's best friend. Time for an interruption. She's giving me that look. An hour later. For what it's worth, I think God is how you deal with everything that's out, that's out of our... <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm struggling today. For what it's worth, I think God is how you deal with everything that's out of your own control. It's as good a definition as any, and I have to wait. Joyce, beside me on the bench seat, having chewed her tennis ball into fragments, is obviously wondering why we should be so, parked so close to a beach, yet not be throwing sticks into the ocean. Joyce never runs out of energy. Joyce, honey, hang in there. Papa's a social blank with a liver like the Hindenburg, and he's embarrassed by how damaged he is and by how me mediocre he turned out. And yes, your moist-eyed stare is a Ginsu knife slicing my heart in two, like a beefsteak tomato. But I won't start writing for a little while. Just yet. That Ginsu knife, uh, it's, it's an old commercial. It slices, dices, chops, chips, and makes julian fries. But wait, it's more. It slices this tin can like a tomato. You know, and then it's an old infomercial. As you can see, I talk to dogs. All animals, really. They're much more direct than people. I knew that even before the massacre. Most people think I'm a near mute. Cheryl did. I wish I were a dog. I wish I were any animal other than a human being. Even a bug. Joyce, by the way, was rejected by the Seeing Eye program because she's too small. Should reincarnation exist, I'd very much like to come back as a Seeing Eye dog. No finer calling exists. Joyce joined my life nearly a year ago at the age of four months. I met her via this crone of a lab reader on Bowen Island whose dream kitchen I helped install. The dream kitchen was a bait to tempt her, her Filipino housekeeper from fleeing to the big city. Joyce was the last of the litter, the gravest, saddest pup I'd ever seen. She slept in my leather coat during the days and then spelunked into my armpits for warmth during breaks. That breeder was no dummy. After a few weeks, she said, look, you two are in love. You do know that, don't you? I hadn't thought of it that way, but once the words were spoken, it was obvious. She said, I think you were meant for each other. Come in on the weekend and put the double pane windows in the TV room and she's yours. Of course, I installed the windows. It's a bit later again, still here in the truck, looking again at the invitation to Kent's memorial this evening. A year ago today, I got a phone call from Barb, your mother, who had married my rock solid brother Kent to much familial glee in 1995. I was driving home along the highway from a Hong Kongers home renovation at the top of the British properties, and it was maybe sexist. And I was wondering what bar to go to, whom to call when the cell phone rang. Remember, this was 1998, and cell phones were a dollar a minute back then. Hard to operate, too. They were big things, you know, not, not these cell phones. They were huge things. With, you pulled the antenna out, very expensive. Jason, it's Barb. Barb, que pasa? Jason, are you driving? I am, quitting time. Jason, pull over. Huh? You heard me. Barb, could you maybe? Jason, Jesus, just pull to the side of the road. Sorry I exist, Eva Braun. I pulled into the shoulder near the Westview exit. Your mother, as you must well know by now, likes to control the situation. Have you pulled over? Yes, Barb. Are you in park? Barb, is micromanaging men your single biggest turn on in life? I've got bad news. What? Kent's dead. I remember watching three swallows play in the heat rising from the asphalt. I asked, how? The police said he was gone in a flash. No pain, no warning, no fear. But he's gone. All right, let's actually a pretty good place to stop. Um, as we'll move forward and Jason will go to the memorial, he'll tell us about the shooting, tell us more about Cheryl, his life after, um, more twists and turns coming. It's really good. Okay, so we're going to stop on page 54 right there at the asterisk. If you're doing your PDF, you know, make sure you mark it. I'll mark mine. And we'll come back tomorrow uh, for day six. Uh, we'll finish, we'll keep reading Jason's section. I hope you all are having a wonderful uh, couple of weeks. I know it's Bye. difficult staying at Watch home. One, and getting out. two, three, four, five. <laughs> No, six. No, this was five today. Five. <laughs> continue the social distancing so we don't continue the spread. And I'll see you when I can see you. I miss you all. I love you. Excellent. All right. See you guys later. Bye. Bye.